All right, everyone, welcome back to the Midwest Mountaineering Outdoor Adventure Expo. Today uh, with me, I have Renee from Nomad Adventures. Um, definitely still a local company, I, although I found out that a lot of these uh, <laughs> staff are working remotely nowadays, as much of you probably are. Uh, today's presentation is on Machu Picchu and beyond, uh, practical advice for traveling in Peru. Uh, so without further ado, here's Renee. Thank you. Um, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming to our presentation. Um, it's a bit, yeah, different not being able to see all your faces and know how many of you are there, but thanks for coming and I'm excited to chat about Peru. Um, so like you said, my name's Renee. I am a trip specialist at Nomad Adventures. Um, so who's Nomad? We are uh, a local company. We were, we actually started in Northern Patagonia, but the founders of the company, Jordan and Tara Harvey, they're originally from the Minneapolis area. So um, that's where we kind of really started the business. We have an office there. It's not the physical office building isn't open currently with COVID. Um, we're all working remotely, as he said, but um, yeah, we do private and custom travel to South America. So what that means is instead of kind of joining a group trip where you sign up to go with a group of people that you don't know on a kind of set fixed itinerary, we instead work with you and your own group. So whether we work with a lot of just couples, we work with groups of friends, families, um, special interest groups as well to design a itinerary custom to you and your own travel style. Um, so we, everything from when you want to go, how active you want to be, how long you have to travel, the types of accommodations you enjoy. Um, so we really learn more about you and the types of trips you like than design an itinerary custom to that, um, and then operate it. So once you arrive on the ground, really everything's taken care of, transfers, hotels, excursions, guiding, um, all of that. So you don't have to worry about and can just enjoy the trip. Um, so a little bit about how that works, our process is, like I said, the first thing is just to learn a little bit more about you um, with what we call a discovery. It's just a quick phone call so I can ask some questions, help educate you on the destination as well. Um, and then we send what's called a skeleton, which is just a high level overview of the trip I'd be recommending. So day one here, day two here. Um, so you can kind of see how often you're moving, can give you a ballpark price with that. And then we put together a full detailed proposal with your exact trip costs before you confirm so you can really see everything um, in detail before nailing anything down. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit about us, but I'm here to talk about Peru. So I'm gonna dive right into it. Um, so here you can see Peru is a pretty good sized country in South America. Um, I, if you haven't been to South America yet, I think Peru is a fantastic first destination to go. I think it has everything I would and a lot of people would really want um, in a destination for a trip. You have just some of the most amazing landscapes I've seen in my life. Beautiful mountains, cloud forests, beautiful lakes, opportunities for some of the most incredible hiking in the world and trekking um, and mountain biking, kayaking, all sorts of different activities. And then you have incredible food. You have some of two of the top 10 restaurants in the world are in Lima actually, but you definitely have some of the most amazing food in South America. You have friendly people, really fascinating history, um, diverse local cultures. Um, so it really has everything you would ever want in a destination. Um, some of the most popular areas to travel are pointed out here in this map. So coming from the States, you're gonna fly into Lima most flights from the U.S. arrive late at night, especially for people coming from Minneapolis. If you're on Delta, you're likely you're going to go to Atlanta and then fly to Lima arriving late at night. Um, that What I often suggest that night is just staying at the airport hotel before then flying to Cusco the next morning. You can add some time in Lima as well. I often like it on the back end actually of a trip because you often end up with a little bit of um, a long layover with connecting flights. So it's nice to have, um, instead of that long layover, have a buffer of a night between that regional and international flight out. Um, but Lima is a cool city. It's, I wouldn't say it's, um, it's not as much of a highlight as some other cities like Buenos Aires, for example. It is a very kind of large and just cosmopolitan city. The reasons I would suggest adding time in Lima are for people who at all consider themselves foodies. Like I said, two of the top 10 restaurants in the world are in Lima. 
Um, so for people who really like to kind of try those top restaurants when they travel. Um, and for people who really enjoy museums as well, the Larco Museum in Lima is fantastic. Um, and if visiting the Larco Museum, I sometimes then prefer it a little bit more on the front end because the Larco Museum um, is a really, gives you a really complete picture of all these different time periods of Peru. Um, but then kind of going further, you have then Cusco, you'll fly to Cusco and we'll dive into each of these other regions more later on as well. Um, but you have Cusco here and then Machu Picchu right here and kind of um, the Sacred Valley is that region between Cusco and Machu Picchu that we'll talk about. Um, for visiting the Amazon, you have two different options. One is going to uh, Northern Peru. This is where if you wanna to go to the Amazon River and not just the Amazon jungle, you need to go to Northern Peru flying to Iquitos. And there are um, some really great cruise options that you can uh, cruise on the Amazon River, actually going back more into its tributaries where the wildlife is really incredible. Um, or going down to the Southern Amazon basin to Puerto Maldonado is the airport you would fly to. Um, this is a really fantastic place for going to the Amazon if you really just have two, three nights to add on to your trip. It's a short, about an hour flight from Cusco, um, not very expensive, doesn't add a lot of cost or time to your trip. And the wildlife here is pretty similar to the wildlife you see up here with just a few differences. Um, the main difference is that here you're not on the Amazon River, but you are in the Amazon jungle um, and you're on a river called the Madre de Dios River. Um, then down here you have Lake Titicaca, um, which is a really great extension option if you are really interested in culture. So you'll get a lot of culture and history here, of course, in Cusco and Machu Picchu. Um, but if it's something that's really kind of a main highlight for you on trips, then I definitely suggest going to Lake Titicaca and we'll talk a little bit more about that region as well later on. And then you have Arequipa, which is another kind of colonial city like Cusco, but less traveled. So if you really like kind of smaller colonial cities, um, it's an interesting spot there to get kind of what you get in Cusco, but with less people. Uh, and nearby you also have the Colca Canyon, which we'll show a little bit of later on as well. Um, so I don't want to dive a ton into it. Um, you'll learn a lot about it while you're there. Uh, but one interesting thing with Peru, the history in Peru that I like to point out is that the Incan Empire actually only lasted a time period of less than 100 years. Um, but it, in that time span, they just, it left such an impact on the country when you're going around and so you see Incan ruins everywhere. Um, you see Incan trail everywhere, not just kind of the famed Incan trail, but you'll see remnants of it all over the country. Um, and it really left an impact in terms of their holidays and cultures and traditions as well. Um, even though there's a much longer period of kind of pre-Incan uh, groups. So that's always something I find really interesting to point out. All right, so let's kind of dive a little bit more into each of those regions I talked about. So like I said, you'll fly into Lima and then whether it's the next day or if you're spending a bit of time in Lima, you'll eventually then fly into Cusco. Um, but I would say the biggest mistake I see people make, both travel planners and people planning their own trips, planning trips to Peru, is um, to fly into Cusco and then immediately stay in Cusco and base your trip from there. Uh, Cusco is at about 11,000 feet, so it's just too high to properly acclimatize. Um, you'll likely not feel very well, you won't sleep very well those first nights. Um, you could have some more severe side effects of altitude sickness in Cusco. So I highly, highly recommend going straight down into the Sacred Valley. Again, that's that region between Machu Picchu and Cusco. Um, it works great to acclimatize there. You're at 9,000 feet there instead of that 11,000 feet. And certainly you're going up and doing excursions at higher altitudes during the day, but it's really important then to be going back down to that lower altitude to sleep at. Um, but aside from that kind of practical standpoint of it being a good spot to acclimatize, it's the Sacred Valley is my personal favorite area of Peru. I just think it's absolutely gorgeous and you have some really cool, more off the beaten path excursion options there. Machu Picchu isn't the only ruin site in Peru. You have so many other really cool ruins to see with less travelers at them as well. They're sprinkled throughout the Sacred Valley. 
Um, this is where you can have some really neat cultural experiences, um, visiting kind of some indigenous communities that we work really closely with. Um, lots of cool, this is where you can do some great off the beaten path hikes, everything from short half day hikes to, um, you know, we have a great hike in this area where you do two days of hiking, which is one night of camping, um, going up to Chewy Cosco, which are these ruins that very few people are ever there. So you're often not seeing anyone else on the hike and then camping at these ruins with, with no one else there. Um, pretty unique experience. So I love the Sacred Valley. It's great for that acclimatization and it's great for getting off the beaten path a bit more as well. Um, I suggest staying here for a minimum of two nights up to four nights. Certainly if you are doing some of those treks like Uchui Costco or really want a slower pace, then definitely I've had travelers stay here more than four nights as well. But for most people that two to four nights is a kind of ideal time frame to stay in the Sacred Valley for. And the Sacred Valley is kind of a whole chain of little towns between basically Cusco and Oyente Tambo, where then you can board the train there to Machu Picchu. Um, Urabamba is one city that's great for looking at accommodations there, or also the small town of Yukai that's just before Urabamba. Lots of hotel options from kind of basic three-star clean and comfortable to some of the nicest five-star luxury hotels in South America. All right. So from there, after your time in the Sacred Valley, then I suggest going to Machu Picchu. My biggest suggestion for most people doing a trip to Peru is to spend at least one night in Aguas Calientes, that town below Machu Picchu, as opposed to doing a day trip to Machu Picchu. Again, kind of going back to some of those common mistakes with planning trips to Peru. If someone arrives, they stay in Cusco right away, do a day trip from there to Machu Picchu. That means at over a two hour train ride from Cusco to Machu Picchu, then about a 30 minute bus ride up to the site and then all of that back again. So you have at least five hours of travel to do a day trip to Machu Picchu and you're just at the site for a short amount of time and then you have to catch your train again. So my biggest recommendation here is to spend at least one night in Aguas Calientes, the town right below just that 30 minute bus ride or less um, below Machu Picchu. Um, th so this is the site, um, kind of a few different time periods you can go to Machu Picchu. If you want to, there are two permitted hikes within the site. Um, these hikes are not operating right now with COVID. Um, we're unsure when they'll start uh, operating again. So it depends a little bit when you guys are looking at planning your trip. Um, but generally, you can do a hike up to Huayna Picchu, which is this mountain right here. So there's a very steep hike here. It's not for people who have a fear of heights. Um, I often compare it to Angel's Landing at Zion. If you've done Angel's Landing before, it kind of has some sections where you're holding on to that cable on the side of the mountain. Um, but it's a really cool hike. You get beautiful views of the site from kind of a bird's eye view. Um, if you want up one of these hikes within the site, but are a little scared of heights, um, then I suggest Cerro Machu Picchu, which is if you're up on Huayna Picchu looking out, it's kind of an opposite mountain from there and you can also hike to the peak of it. So both of those are permitted hikes. You need to have permits in advance to do them. Um, if going through us, we take care of all of that for you, we buy permits for Huayna Picchu pretty much by default for everyone unless we've had a specific conversation that someone doesn't want to do it. Otherwise, it's pretty much by default for everyone going to Machu Picchu. But these hikes only ha have permits in the morning. So if you want to do one of those hikes, you need to at least plan to have a morning at Machu Picchu. Um, if you really want a good amount of time there, you can plan for an afternoon permit as well so you get more time to explore the site. Um, otherwise, if you're not interested in one of those hikes, I suggest considering kind of that afternoon time slot. The morning, especially from like 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. is the busiest time at the site. Um, whereas in the afternoon from 3 to 5 p.m., it's really magical. That's when the site starts clearing out more of visitors. Um, it's my personal favorite time at the site. Um, so I, I, I suggest having a bit of that time there as well. Now, how to get to Machu Picchu is a question I get a lot and there's a few different ways. Um, I'd say one of the most common misconceptions is sometimes people think they really have to hike to get to Machu Picchu and that's not true. You can 
like I said, take the train all the way to Aguas Calientes and then the bus ride up to the site. The site is, there's a lot of stairs and a lot of walking involved in the site. So you still do want to, um, you know, be in good enough shape to do that walking, but you don't have to do the full Inca trail to get to Machu Picchu. Um, but the other option to get to Machu Picchu is hiking. So the full Inca trail we do as three nights of camping and four full days of hiking. Um, I highly recommend doing it that way if you're interested in the full trek. Uh, I would say 90% of companies do three nights of camping, but that fourth day is a very, they wake up before it's light out, do this kind of rush to the site to get there for the sunrise. Um, but as you can see, Machu Picchu is surrounded by higher mountains and it is a cloud forest. So it's often kind of cloudy in the morning and that has you getting there at a time when actually a lot of travelers are rough, rushing to get there. Um, so instead, and it, most importantly, in my opinion, it puts you on the trail at the same spot as all of these other people hiking it, which there's 500 people a day can start hiking the Inca Trail. Um, so by doing this other route that we do where it's four full days of hiking and you arrive in the late afternoon, which like I said, is the nicest time when the site's really cleared out and the lights often best, see the site for the first time and then go down to Aguas Calientes to go back up the next morning. You can do one of those permitted hikes, do your full tour of the site, you're well rested, you're showered, you're not kind of exhausted from just having finished the trek. It's a lot better way to do it that way, but also because most importantly, it puts you at a different spot on the trail as most other people. So here we have a map of kind of how we do the Inca trail. Um, we use smaller campsites that we can use because of some strict environmental restrictions that we meet. Um, but it also this first day we have you hiking on the other side of the river as all those other travelers. This is a private campsite right here. So you're generally the only group that's here this evening. And then really kind of this full day, you generally with the way we do it, kind of the other people are ahead of you because they're rushing to the site quicker. Um, and so at this point, you this first day, you don't really see anyone. The second day, you hardly see any other groups, mostly just kind of some small local communities along there. This third and fourth day, you do start running into more people. Um, but this campsite is nearly often private as well aren't many other groups there. So I think that's the biggest benefit of doing the Inca Trail this way is that you're not hiking it with as many other people around you. It's a really kind of more, um, more close to private experience um, being at a different point on the trail. And then, like I said, arriving in the afternoon, I think is just really special as well. Um, so yeah, this is the Inca Trail, the full Inca Trail. Like I said, it's those full, four days. Looking at the mileage here, I'd say don't let that trick you. It is a very difficult trek. Um, it's a lot of up and down. Kind of this day looks like this, but really it's a lot of this too. Um, you're doing a lot of hiking up and down Incan steps, so it can be hard on the knees. And then remember you're hiking at altitude as well. The highest altitude on here is almost 14,000 feet. Um, so it's definitely a trek you want to be in good shape for, you want to prepare for, um, and go into it, I'd say really mentally with that mindset of part of the joy of the Inca Trail is really challenging you um, and doing something that is difficult. But if, if you're looking for that, it's an incredible experience, absolutely beautiful. Um, and we have photos of some of these campsites later on as well, then you'll just see how pretty they are. Um, but if you want that experience of hiking to Machu Picchu, but you don't want to do the full trek, there is something called the Inca Trail Express, which is basically you doing just that last day of the Inca Trail. So you take the train in, but you get off before it arrives to Inaguas Calientes, you get off at kilometer 104 with your guide, and then you hike the final day of the Inca Trail. So kind of starting around here, and you hike up to these Winawina ruins, which is important to note. You can see there's lots of ruin sites along the Inca Trail that you can only see if you're, um, if you're hiking the Inca Trail, but you get off the train, hike up to those beautiful Winawina ruins, then to the Intipunku Sun Gate, where you have those first views of Machu Picchu, the way the Incans arrived to it, and then down to Machu Picchu. 
So if you want the experience of hiking to Machu Picchu, but you don't have the time for the full Inca trail trek, or you, you know, don't want to quite be doing something that challenging or don't want to camp, doing this Inca Trail Express is, is a really awesome option. Um, it also works great for groups where some of you want to hike and some of you are less active. Those who are less active just stay on the train all the way to Aguas Calientes while others get off to hike. So it works great for groups like that as well. Um, continuing on, so after you've spent your time in Machu Picchu, I suggest one to two nights in that Aguas Calientes town. Um, then continue on to Cusco. Cusco is a really cool city. It's one of my favorite cities in South America. Um, so you do want to spend time there, but just do it at the end of the trip where you're better acclimatized. At this point, depending on your trip up to here, you've generally had four net to seven or more nights in this region acclimatizing. So you're, you're better acclimatized to be sleeping at that 11,000 altitude. Uh, by now, um, but it is a really cool city. It's easy to navigate as well, um, very walkable. Food there as well is fantastic. Um, it doesn't have some of those top restaurants as Lima, but it has some of the most incredible food I've eaten and, and really fantastic restaurants. Um, minimum one night here, but that's on the shorter end. I suggest two nights so you get a true full day in the city. Um, and for people who like a slower pace, like cities like this, three nights can be great as well lots of different hotel options as well. Again, everything from pretty basic up to some of the most luxurious hotels in all of South America. Um, all right, so from there kind of that's the core of most people's trip is that Sacred Valley Cus or Sacred Valley Machu Picchu Cusco portion. Right now we're usually at at least a week time frame if you're doing the full Inca Trail or really kind of doing some of these other off the beaten path hikes and doing a slower pace then you may be at 10 days or even more. Um, and then from there, you can think about some really, you know, you can then fly home or think about some really great extension options in Peru. Um, one of my favorites is the Amazon. I do really like it combined with what we've just described because it's so drastically different. Um, you have beautiful landscapes in that area we just described, but you also, it has a lot of focus on culture and history and ruins. And here it's very much wildlife, very different landscapes being down now at sea level in the Amazon jungle. Um, the wildlife experience here is, it's not like an African safari. It's very much where you go searching for the wildlife and part of the cool aspect of it is experiencing their camouflage. Um, it's amazing what your guide points out that it's a frog camouflaged on this leaf here you would never see or the family of monkeys up in the trees jumping around. Um, it's really kind of going out into the jungle, searching for that wildlife on different kind of jungle hikes. Um, you can go to a lake and do some kind of canoeing there as well. Um, but this is a great, you can add it on with just as little as two nights. Uh, one of my favorite lodges there is Reserva Amazonica. Their two night package, I think, runs for about 530 or so. Um, so it doesn't add that much cost and the flight doesn't add that much either. So it, you add a whole unique aspect to your trip by just adding on a few nights. If you have the time for it, the budget for it, I do like three nights. Two nights just gives you one full day of excursions in the jungle, whereas with three nights you have a bit more time to relax as well and do a variety of excursions. Um, this is all what I've been talking about, that Puerto Maldonado area, not far from Cusco. You do also have the option to go up north. It does take a bigger chunk of budget with the cruises up there cruising on the river being quite um, quite expensive and it does take more time as well. It's longer flights, you often have to connect back through Lima depending on the flight schedules. So I really suggest considering the North for people who don't see the Amazon as an add-on but see it as more just as much a focus of their trip as Machu Picchu. Another really great extension is Lake Titicaca. Works great for two to three nights. For people who like a slower pace, four nights can be nice as well. Um, like I said, it's great for culture. My biggest recommendation here and biggest what I'd say mistake people make traveling here is to stay right in the city of Puno, stay just two nights there, do this very standard full day where you're going out and seeing the Oros Islands just offshore from Puno. And that has the potential to feel like a very touristy experience. What I instead suggest is stay outside of Puno, further out on the lake. Um, there's some great hotels just kind of right out of the city, out on this peninsula there. 
And then going out to, there's this whole cluster of these floating islands. There are these islands that are made out of reeds from the lakes and they have homes on the islands. The ones right offshore from Puno, it's a whole cluster of about 80 or more of them. And those, for the most part, people don't really truly live on those islands anymore. So what we do with our travelers, and I suggest to everyone, is going further out to the Titinos floating islands, where it's a small collection of just a few. Um, and it's families that really do still live on these islands, make their living off of fishing on the lake. Um, and it's just, it's a really interesting and cool experience to, to get to know them. And then also go to Tequila Island, which this isn't a floating island, Tequila Island's a real island, but it's like a step back in time. Um, there's no electricity on the island, just really interesting um, cultures, both here and in the kind of Cusco Sacred Valley area. You can kind of tell a lot by someone just by like the hat they're wearing, what community they're from, if they're married or if they're single, if they're looking for someone, it's just some really interesting things to learn, learn about the cultures here. Um, if you tend to lean more towards luxury level accommodations, then I highly recommend looking into Tidilaca, which is a fantastic luxury uh, hotel here. All right, then you have Arequipa and the Colca Canyon, which is another extension option. Um, if you have time for a two week or longer trip, you can even combine this with Lake Titicaca. It's about a full day, scene, or a little less than a full day scenic drive from Lake Titicaca to the Colca Canyon. Um, which is, if you've ever wanted to see Andean condors up close, this is the place to do it. It's really incredible as the sun shines on the canyon and it heats up, the condors kind of ride it up and you see them really not that far from you as well soaring by. Um, it's, it's pretty incredible and, and they're there pretty much every morning you can see them. Um, so if you have any interest in that, it's also just beautiful scenery. You have some hot springs there in the Colca Canyon area. Um, and then it's about, I think it's around four hours or so from Arequipa to then connect to another really cool colonial city and fly from there out to Lima. So this is another cool extension option. I more often suggest it really tying it into Lake Titicaca for kind of a nice full, full loop trip. All right, so now I just have kind of some different photos I'm gonna show of some of what we've talked about so far. Um, so this is a site called Saksai Woman. It's right outside of Cusco. So like I said, I suggest flying into Cusco and then pretty much heading straight to the Sacred Valley that day to get to those lower altitudes. Um, but this is a great visit that works well on the way. You are still at altitude here. It's actually above Cusco. But as you can see, it's a very flat site. So while a lot of ruin sites have you climbing up a lot of stairs, here, it really doesn't require that much difficult walking here. So it's nice while you're acclimatizing to be walking at a flat site. Um, and it's also a neat introduction to the Incan ruins because the I think the stonework here is more impressive than Machu Picchu. If you can see, there's just giant stones that are taller than you are and um, you can't even slide a piece of paper in between the stones. They're so close together. Um, and it's right on your way out of Cusco to the Sacred Valley. So it works great for a stop that day. And then here's just some photos of kind of what you'll see in the Sacred Valley. Lots of um, local communities there, a lot of farmland, um, and then really great potential to be active. There's great mountain biking here, lots of different, we can do pretty fairly easy mountain biking um, and we have a support vehicle the whole time. So again, for groups where some wanna be more active than others, it can work well. Some can ride their bike one hour, then throw the bikes over in the vehicle and continue in the vehicle while others ride for longer. The guide also kind of is checking out people's levels and determining the best route based on that. Um, for people who are really advanced, we definitely want to know that in advance to do some of the uh, more kind of advanced routes, but lots of different options. You can also do kayaking in the Sacred Valley. Um, this is at our base camp on Lake Pirai, which is a um, nice lake in the Sacred Valley. We also set up a Pachamanca on the lake. So it's a cool, and this is really a lot of Peru where it really marries these great active excursions with culture really well. So we spend the morning kayaking, stand up paddleboard on the lake, and then set up this 
really cool lunch called a pachamanca where you dig a hole in the ground, you heat these hot stones in the ground for hours. So they're heating from before the time you arrive. And then they take the stones off, they put the food in, they cover it again, um, basically making an oven in the ground. And it's the tr this traditional celebratory feast and the food is just, um, I mean, you talk about top restaurants in Peru, but this is some of the best food I've, I've had in Peru is just the, these pachamancas, they're so good. Um, this is also the Sacred Valley. Um, so one thing we'll kind of talk a little bit about later with seasons is you have in Peru, it's really a wet season and a dry season. So the wet season is from end of November, kind of through early April. Um, and I say wet cautiously because you do get a big difference between those time frames and the dry season, June, July, August but it's not a destination where you have monsoons, everyday rain all day, and you do have less travelers during that time. Um, so it's not something where I suggest people don't travel at all then. It's more be prepared to get some rain on your trip if you're going that late November through early April timeframe. Um, that kind of early April timeframe, which is when these photos were taken, is actually one of my favorites because you don't get as much rain as February or March but everything is lush and green. Flowers are in bloom because of all the recent rain. So you can see, to kind of show you the contrast, this is the dry season. So this is probably taken September, October, kind of after dry season, whereas then this is um, more what you see if going kind of during the rainy season or, or right after the rainy season before things um, start to dry up more. This is another site in the Sacred Valley that I love. It's called Maras. Um, these are, you can't really tell from this photo, but there's actually thousands of salt pans that kind of tumble down this mountainside. Um, and they're still being harvested today in the traditional way, in the sense that each family from the Maras community has this a salt pan that they is their salt pan and they're responsible for harvesting it and get the profit from it. Um, so as this kind of tiny, really salty stream flows down, the water flows down into the salt pans, and as it evaporates, they then harvest the salt. Um, a beautiful and just really fascinating spot ties well into Moray, which isn't far away from Maras, which are these really neat circular agricultural terraces where they basically think the Incans discovered the effects of growing crops at uh, different altitudes. Again, fascinate, fascinating, but just really gorgeous setting as well. These sites tie well in together in one day to even do mountain biking between the sites is kind of your form of transportation that day or uh, horseback riding as well is a, is a neat option. Um, so also in the Sacred Valley, you can do some really neat excursions connecting more with the indigenous communities there. We've worked really hard to build a close relationship with the community called the Hamaru community. Um, so it's nothing like this kind of touristy roadside stop where you get out, you take your photos and go. It's really more of a cultural exchange. You spend the full morning with the community, learning about their lifestyle. They take you out into their farmland. They show you the plants that they um, grow and that they use to then make these really bright dyes and create these incredible weavings. And you see the whole process of that from the plants that are used for the dyes, making the... Um, the material there and then putting the weaving together. You can see the whole process there. Um, so really cool experience if that's something that interests you as well. You can see there, it's just really beautiful. Quinoa, um, they use it for dyeing as well, but that, that's quinoa. Kui is a, or guinea pig is a food you'll see a lot through the Sacred Valley, Valley just being sold on the, the side of the road. Just kind of some more, some hotels in the Sacred Valley. Um, this is near the site of Moray, a really awesome um, picnic that we set up that day. Um, so you, here you can see again, I think a good example of the dry season versus um, the rainy season or just right after the rainy season. These pictures are taken in very similar locations. Uh, this is Tara, one of Nomad's co-founders at the PSAC Market, um, which is a site in the Sacred Valley. If you want to do some shopping, that's a great spot for it. 
And this is Oriente Tambo, uh, one of the spots to catch the train going to Aguas Calientes. And these are the Oriente Tambo ruins. Um, so as I kind of talked about with a lot of sites, they require a lot of walking upstairs. Um, this is something I see people do sometimes too with planning trips is, is Oriente Tambo, one of the first sites you see, but it, it requires a lot of climbing upstairs for this site. So I suggested it a little bit later on when you're more acclimatized, but it's a cool spot. Um, so kind of some other trekking options. We talked about the Inca Trail. Um, another great trek, which right now, again, it depends when you're looking at traveling. The Inca Trail is not open right now. They're unsure when it will be open. Um, they're kind of trying to figure out the logistics of how to keep people safe on it with all the porters, cooks, everyone that's needed to operate the Inca Trail. Um, but you can do some other really cool off the beaten path treks in Peru. One of them is Salkin Tai, which these photos are from. Um, there's a few different kind of cool routes you can do for Salkin Tai if you want to do a trek but you don't want to camp. This is also where you have a lodge to lodge trek as a really nice option. Um, it's also a difficult hike um, and you are here at even higher altitudes. You get above 15,000 feet here when you're going over the Salkin Tai Pass. But because of that, you have this beautiful kind of alpine scenery. Working that pass there. Um, another advantage of Salkantai, or there's another great off the beaten path trek called Choki Kirao, where you go to these, they really rival Machu Picchu in size, but only get a small handful of visitors each day, Choki Kirao. That's another kind of different trek option. The advantages of those is if, if you really want to do a trek, but you're a little bit nervous about it, is we have on those what we call emergency horses. So on the Inca Trail, they are not allowed to have any llamas, horses, donkeys, anything like that. Whereas on these we can for helping carrying things, but also we have one as kind of, like I said, an emergency horse where if someone's having a hard time finishing the hike that day, they can jump over onto the horse. Um, and that can be comforting for some people knowing that they will have that option if, if they're having a hard time finishing the day's hike, where really you, you don't have that choice on the Inca Trail. So some more photos um, of the Salkin Tai Trek. Beautiful scenery you get there. And then this is now the Inca Trail. So this is right where that kind of first campsite is. It's right below these ruins, um, which is, you know, when I was, this is my sister and I, um, when we were there, we were the only group there. This is what you're hiking on for the Inca Trail. So that does contribute, I'd say, to the difficulty level of it, um, is you're hiking on this and even more so this and a lot of stairs. So it is a lot of kind of upstairs. So if you're training for the Inca Trail, I suggest, you know, doing stair machines or putting the treadmill up on the highest setting um, and, and training that way is one good option. Um, these are coca leaves, which the porters, they're, um, you'll see coca leaves at pretty much any hotel or restaurant you're at in Peru, especially in this area. They're used to help with the altitude sickness to make a tea or the porters, or um, you can also have them on the Inca Trail to them um, to help with, again, with the altitude. Um, this is my sister and I at the highest point that about 14,000 on the Inca Trail. Um, it's called Dead Woman's Pass, actually, is the translation. Um, but you have beautiful views from there. And some more kind of photos of the campsites. This is that first one. This is the second campsite we generally use. Um, when I was here, we were the only group here. So again, it's often a um, pretty private spot, which is nice and just beautiful setting, as you can see. I think um, this was maybe in the evening or early morning. And of course, Machu Picchu. It says Aguas Calientes, that town below Machu Picchu, where I suggest staying. This is uh, my husband and I at Machu Picchu. More photos of um, within the site. Um, so this is that view from Huayna Picchu that I mentioned, climbing up that main mountain, you get a nice bird's eye view of the site. This is that road that takes you up from Aguas Calientes 
to Machu Picchu. Um, if you've ever heard of the Sanctuary Lodge, that's the hotel right here. It's important to note you do not have views of Machu Picchu from the hotel. That's a common misconception. And you also do not get special access to the site from that. It just simply means you're already there and you don't have to take the, you don't have to get in line and take the bus up in the morning, which is nice and you're right there. Um, but it does come at a hefty price tag. I more often recommend the hotels uh, right below in, in Aguas Calientes. More photos from within the site, Machu Picchu. That's Jordan and Tara, Nomad's co-founders. Some pretty orchids, again, kind of what you can see during that um, rainy season. This is another um, Pachamanca set up along with the cock of the rock bird in Aguas Calientes. And some photos of Cusco. There's a great market there, the San Pedro market that I love. I mean, I always love going to markets when I travel, but this one especially is cool. Um, there's a nice market visit with cooking class we can do as well. This is on Tequile Island, so of going to Lake Titicaca. And it's a great spot for some kayaking if you'd like to do kayaking. Um, you can even kayak out to Tequila Island and then spend a night at a homestay we have set up there. Um, it is very basic accommodations, but for people who like that and like kind of getting out of their comfort zone a little bit on a trip, um, it's a really special experience. Those floating islands, they even make the boats out of the reeds from the lake and the homes on them really fascinating. And um, here it's a lot of the ruined sites you can see around Lake Titicaca are more pre-Incan. Um, so that's cool as well to see something a little bit different than most in the Cusco area are more Incan. Um, so again, you can tell a lot by someone just by their hat and, and what they're wearing. More of Tequila Island. And these are Siustani, again, that's pre-Incan. Um, ruins outside of near Lake Titicaca. This is flying into Puerto Maldonado. So this is the Madre de Dios River going to a lodge like Reserva Amazonica is, is one nice option there. The town Puerto Maldonado seeing it on the way to then you take a boat up river for about an hour to two hours to the lodge. Some really cool, you can see lots of macaws there, monkeys, lots of monkeys. Sometimes you see them even just around the lodge. Um, you can do a nighttime jungle walk, which is cool as well. Um, and they also do a nighttime jungle boat ride. So you can see the look for the caimans. The giant river otters you can sometimes see in a lake nearby. And just Really interesting. This is that Lake Sandoval where you can take these dugout canoes, the guide and go. Um, they also have a canopy. Um, all the lodges, most of them will have canopy towers. Reserva Amazonica has a canopy walkway system, which is kind of neat to actually walk through the jungle that way. Um, and just beautiful landscapes, but very different, like I said, from what you see in, in Cusco, Machu Picchu, which is why I, I really like that combo. Can do some piranha fishing. <laughs> and some kayaking at some of the lodges. And um, nice little hammocks at Reserva Amazonica in, in front of the private casitas that you have. Um, so this is kind of a review of, of what we just talked about. Um, a lot of, you know, most people's trips focused on this area, the, the Southern Highlands, um, and those are all the different regions in that area that we just discussed. Um, so like I said, the biggest difference in weather in Peru is that um, rainy season and dry season. As you can see, the average temperature does not change much throughout the year. You do, it does get a little bit colder June, July, August. That's when on the Inca Trail, you're most likely to have temperatures that drop below freezing. 
at night. Um, but you can see rain is really the biggest difference. So it kind of starts late November and then goes through kind of the first half of April. Um, even more so the past few years, April has been seeing um, more rain I'd see. But, um, and then you can see that's the drastic difference. You go in June, oh, July, August, there's really a lot less rain at that time. But there's also more people. So it, you know, as people debate when to go, it depends a little bit. Do which do you mind more, uh, more crowds or a little bit more rain? Um, prepping for your trip to Peru. So does Peru have any visa requirements or is there anything I need to do ahead of time to get into the country? Um, this is a bit of an interesting question to answer right now with COVID. Um, and I will say it's always changing. Um, a little over a month ago, my answer to this question would have been different than it is today. And my guess is in a month, my answer will be different as well. Um, usually you just need a passport that's good for six months beyond your dates of travel and pre-COVID that's what you needed. Um, right now with the travel restrictions, you also need a COVID test within 72 hours of flying to Peru. Um, that can be a PCR test or an antigen test. The antigen tests are the ones um, that are generally the quicker tests. So that's nice at least that you, um, you can take the test that's a little bit more rapid. So you can, um, it's easier to meet that requirement of 72 hours. Um, and then once you arrive in Peru, we need to have you take another COVID test um, once you arrive. So you'll arrive to Peru with your negative COVID test from within 72 hours. We'll pick you up, take you what I suggest generally, just that airport hotel or into your hotel in Lima. We'll have someone arrive likely the next morning to take, they'll just come to your hotel, take that COVID test. You'll have the results soon um, and then can continue with the trip with those negative test results once you've arrived in the country as well. Um, and then for anywhere traveling back to the US now, the US does require a negative COVID test. Again, the rapid antigen ones are fine from within three days to fly back to the US. Again, that's something that we arrange. So depending on your itinerary, again, we'll have someone come to your hotel, administer the test and we'll get the results to you so you can have those to then board your flight home. Um, what immunizations and shots do I need to travel to Peru? So aside from everything I just went through with COVID, um, there's no other immunizations. And I will say Peru isn't one of the ones that's accepting the COVID vaccine instead of the test right now. And that could change soon, but um, right now it's just those COVID testing requirements. The vaccine um, won't take the place of those. Um, but aside from that, you don't need any immunizations for traveling to Peru. If you're going to the Amazon, we do suggest a yellow fever vaccination. Um, it's not required, but recommended. Um, some sources you'll see recommend uh, malaria, but for this area of the Amazon where you're going, um, it's, it's not really needed for that region. If you haven't had it, hepatitis A and typhoid are a good idea as well. Money, um, I just suggest getting local uh, currency from ATMs there. There's an ATM at the Lima airport. There's several ATMs there. There are also ATMs at that um, airport hotel if you're staying there your first night and throughout Lima. There's ATMs in Cusco. They are harder to come by in the Sacred Valley, are the, although they are there. There's one or two in Aguas Calientes. So using ATMs throughout your trip is the best and easiest way to get money. Um, and the converter adapter. Um, so technically, yes, you need a converter adapter. However, most electronics nowadays do accept the higher 220 volt. So for example, when I travel, generally the only thing I'm using is my computer and my phone. Um, and both of those do accept that higher voltage. So just check those before you go. Um, and you may be fine without that converter. And then adapter as well, pretty much all the hotels in Peru, they do have the US type as well. Um, so, you know, when I was there for a month, I never once had to use an adapter. So, well, technically it is a different voltage based on your electronics, you might be fine without a converter adapter. No, you cannot drink the water. We will, on our trips, we provide, um, a large jug of water for you to be refilling your water bottle throughout the day. Um, and then same thing at hotels, usually at breakfast, they'll provide water you can use to 
refill your water bottles or um, at the restaurants there um, at your hotel or a lot of them will have jugs that you can use as well. So bring a water bottle that you can be constantly refilling with clean water. Um, packing the those I don't like that weather chart we showed that just shows the averages of 55 because you do get a big swing. Lows can be in the 30s or even lower and highs can be in the 70s. And as the sun gets covered with clouds, it, it changes pretty quickly. So layers, layers, layers are key throughout the year in Peru. Um, and even if going in dry season, I do suggest always having your rain layers as well. Um, but especially in wet season, and if doing a hiking heavy itinerary, have um, those rain layers, including rain pants if you're trekking. Um, so just kind of to look at um, some sample itineraries to kind of go through what I talked through a bit of how I suggest doing it. That for, this is a sample itinerary on our website. We have lots of sample itineraries up you can take a look at, but everything we do is private and custom. So if you are interested, in a trip with us, the first step is really to reach out so we can make our own suggestions for your trip. Um, but this is a nice sample one online I like a lot. That first day you arrive in Lima, you really don't, like I said, end up seeing the city that day because you're most likely arriving late at night. Um, the next day then fly to Cusco. This is that day I talked about of heading straight to the Sacred Valley, visiting some sites like Saxai Woman on the way and then spending two full days in the Sacred Valley. So this has three nights in the Sacred Valley, which I really recommend. Um, one day is a lighter activity day while you're acclimatizing, um, focused more on culture. So this itinerary has you visiting the Amaru indigenous community and then visiting the Pisac ruins and the Pisac market as well, um, ties in well that day. And then this day mountain biking to those sites I showed, Maras, the salt pans, and Morai, the agricultural terraces. And then doing that one day hike on the Inca Trail, the Inca Trail Express to Machu Picchu, overnighting in Aguas Calientes, and then having a full day at Machu Picchu. So you get morning there, afternoon there, spending another night in Aguas Calientes. And then slowly making your way back to Cusco, visiting Oyente Tambo and those ruins there, having a nice, lunch at an hacienda um, before arriving to Cusco. And then two nights in Cusco at the end of the trip. So you have a true full day there before then flying to Lima and arriving home actually on day 10. Um, so that's a really nice, oh, nice trip. Great for being really active, a variety of different activities to do. Um, 10 days, so fits pretty well with a full week with the two weekends. Um, so that's one great sample you can consider. Um, there are other samples on our website. I'm not gonna go through each one of them. You can review them there because um, I wanna leave a little bit of time for questions if we have them, but this one's classic Machu Picchu, which is very similar to Peru Active Explorer. I just discussed, but less active. And then you have the full Inca Trail. The, my biggest recommendation with this itinerary is it has two nights in the Sacred Valley. If you have the time for it, I suggest adding a third so you get a little bit more acclimatization before starting that trek. But here without adding that day, it's 10 days door to door. And some sample other kind of itineraries as well. Um, so one last thing before we dive into questions, usually at this point at the expo, I let everyone know I have these $200 travel credits sitting at the desk in front of us if you want them. We of course can't do that. So if you are interested in planning and booking a trip with us, um, please email us after this presentation and I can send you this travel credit virtually. Um, we do want you to email us and within a week or so of the presentation because I think these go up on YouTube and, and we don't want it necessarily um, you know, we want it for people who have attended the presentation. So if you just email us at travel at nomadadventures.com, like it is on our website, um, email us within a week or two after the presentation, let us know you attended and, and you'd like the travel credit and we will send it over to you. Um, and with that, I will open it up to any questions. Hi, Renee, can you hear me? I can. Excellent. Great. Uh, that sounded great. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, a lot of good information there. Um, and for me personally, I, I think I mentioned this last time, um, I love seeing all these wonderful photos of South America in general, uh, Peru specifically. I've I've been fortunate enough to be, go down there a few times. Oh, awesome. And, um, you know, just hearing the names again just brings back so many memories. And, 
and even st- I'm like, I, I hear the name and it's not even so much of a memory. It's just like a feeling. <laughs> and and in this time right now of not being able to travel as, as extensively as we would like, maybe some of us have more flexibility with that. It's a, it's a really nice reminder. So thank you <laughs> for sharing awesome. all that. <laughs> yeah. and, um, I, I remember uh, briefly um, one time when I was down there, I was traveling from um, <clears throat> La Paz to Puno and uh, I had hurt my knee on the um, mountain biking in in uh, in Bolivia down the uh, what do they call that road? It's like the death road or something. I can't remember exactly. And I ended up crashing and having my knee injured. But I sat on the bus and you know it was a very long bus ride to get over. And I remember just being a lot yeah. of pain. And when I got out in Puno, there was the uh, Virgen de la Candelaria uh, festival going on. And oh yeah, it was incredible just to see all these different. Um, I guess I'll call them like families, just like the way they, they were, they, they sort of identified themselves through, through, through costume, through, through clothing, through mm-hmm. all these other ways that I, I wouldn't have no, no idea. And I remember just walking through that festival. I had no idea what's going on and was just blown away at all the, the, the magic of the parade and the food and the ambiance. And yeah, I, t- I took some of my most favorite photos at that festival and that's awesome. That's cool. You got to see that. Um, yeah, yeah, and and uh, I that's one of my biggest memories of of I, I I was fortunate enough to spend probably close to about a year down in South America, just kind of hitchhiking around and doing whatever awesome. I wanted. But uh, that one will definitely stick out for me. Um, and and the floating islands out there are pretty cool. Titicaca, what a wonderful thing. Yeah. Um <clears throat> The uh, uh, you know the 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 there's so much to see at Machu Picchu. You know, there's, it's so intricate and, and there's so, it's so topographical that you can, and I think if I'm not mistaken, they kind of, am I correct in thinking they limit the number of Pichu, people up to Huayna Pichu? Still probably? Yeah. Yeah. yeah Huayna Pichu, I think it's a hundred or 200 each time slot. Um, so wow. it's really not that many and they sell out far in advance. It's not something you can wait and purchase once you're there. Yeah. Um, they, I mean, some months they'll sell more than two months in advance. Um, oh goodness! Wow. Wine and <laughs> permit, so. Yeah. Um. You might have you might have mentioned this in your presentation, but um, sort of best time of year to go for maybe people that are in this tri-state region. What would be a, what would you recommend or? Yeah, it depends. Like I said, a little bit what you want and when. You, I think any time of year is a fine time to go to Peru, depending a little bit if. You know, if you really want to avoid when uh, avoid people, avoid kind of more crowds, which we do a good job on our trips of avoiding that at any time of year. Mm-hmm. Um, even going in February is fine. You're going to get the most rain then, but the Inca Trail is actually closed at that time of year. So you really have less people there, which can be nice. But overall, generally, I really like the shoulder season. So the most popular times is, you know, when kids are out of school in the summer is June, July, August. So if you don't need to travel during that time, I really like that kind of late April, if you don't mind a little bit of rain and May timeframe, um, everything's, especially early May, everything's still lush, green. Um, You might get a little bit of rain, but not much. Um, And then you're before things really pick up. Yeah. That June, July, August timeframe. Um, And then same thing on the opposite side, kind of September, October is really nice, even early November before rainy season starts and when you have less time people there as well. Um, so those are kind of my two favorite times. Um, for people in Minnesota, I, I we were just talking about this before we started. I love getting out of Minnesota in April when I'm kind of over winter, but yeah. winter's not over all the time in April. So that can be one of my favorite times to go because I love leaving then. And it's, I think, such a beautiful time in Peru. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> I remember I, this was, I think, before I knew about Nomad Adventures, but um, I uh, was in Cusco <clears throat> trying to figure out a way to get to Machu Picchu, and I was in the the Central Plaza, and I had been traveling with whomever at that time, and I remember uh, in the plaza, I feeling a tap on my shoulder, and unbeknownst to me, a friend here from the cities was writing a piece for the Pioneer Press traveling south. Oh, it's towards Patagonia. So we completely were just like, wow, what are you doing here? I had no idea we were going to be in, in Cusco at this time. So we decided to go to Machu Picchu. We had a couple days and we just like rented a cab. They took us as far as they were willing to go. 
we got on a bus and it was a kind of an overnight ride. And I remember all of a sudden the bus just stopping and it was dark time and or nighttime. And, and basically the bus driver was like, all right, we're just going to spend the night here. And we're like, what? So everyone just went to bed <laughs> on the bus, kind of wake up in the morning with people kind of shuffling, getting off the bus. And we realized that, you know, the, I wish the bus driver had given us a bit more information, but the river had swelled up so much. This was in March that it had mm -hmm. washed away the bridge. So through oh, the night, no. so the, through the night, they had to figure out how to get, um, build a bridge, and they ended up making this sort of walkway across. And on the other side of the bridge and the river, there was other buses waiting there to finish to <laughs> finish the transport. Oh my gosh! <laughs> but I remember walking by the uh, Udabambo River. I think that's what it's called, right? Mm -hmm. And it was just, I mean, I've done some some whitewater rafting and, and paddling and kayaking and stuff. And it's usually like class three, four, five. These were some of the biggest waves that look like. Wow. Ch yeah. Chocolate milk just everywhere. And just, it was so loud. And so uh, it had so much force. I will never forget that. It was really, wow. really amazing. Um, I definitely made, uh, I had definitely had a lot of help from the, uh, the coca leaves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I found that making a uh, help and the, the tea helps a lot. Yeah, the tea. I, I I would find like, you know, um, I'm probably a little bit more used to that uh, sort of bitter, sort of uh, herbal flavor now. But I think at the time I was like maybe sweetening it with a little bit of honey or sugar, and it was just um just make yeah. it make it go down a little bit easier. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that was super helpful. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, that's so great. I I I hope to. Uh, go down there at some point again and uh, hopefully bring my family bring the yeah kids and stuff. that'd be a wonderful time so um nomad will be hearing from us at some point <laughs> <laughs> definitely reach out yeah yeah definitely um i don't see any other questions here um i just want to say thank you renee again for presenting on uh machu picchu and beyond nomad has been a great partner of the store uh, and the expo for far longer than i probably even know so thanks to nomad adventure uh, Jordan and Tara for creating an awesome company. I know you guys are really world renowned in um, the way you take care of your clients. And I see that here in the presentation. So thank you. Um, coming up later today, we have, oh, what do we got going on? <clears throat> we have slacklining in Minnesota and then uh, trekking Everest, a route for everyone to kind of finish off the day. Just want to remind everyone that the presentations are being recorded and archived on our YouTube page and the outdooradventureexpo.com site. Um, and just a big thanks to Renee, Nomad Adventures again. Um, thanks for everyone for tuning in and we'll see you probably in another hour or so for another presentation. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for hosting such a great event and figuring out how to do it all again with, with technology and everything. We, we appreciate it and it's fun yeah. that you keep going with it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Renee. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye. Bye.